Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Brandi Nanaki, the director of the Citrus Policy Lab headquartered at UC Berkeley and also operating on the campuses of UC Davis, UC Merced, and UC Santa Cruz. Welcome to the 12th year of the Citrus Research Exchange Seminar Series. We have hosted a remarkable lineup of technology innovators in person at Sutar Shaddai Hall. Does anybody remember in-person meetings? <laughs> Um, and we're glad, though, that you're able to join us today virtually for the Fall 2020 series. Before we begin the talk, I want to first highlight a few upcoming Citrus events. On October 6th, Society, Robots, and Us will be held at 6 p.m. Pacific, where we will continue the conversation about important robotic topics and socio-technical issues led by domain experts and interesting thinkers to discuss topics relating to robotics innovation, commercialization, and inclusivity. You'll see on the screen more information on how to register for that event. The next Citrus Research Exchange will be held on Wednesday, October 7th from 12 to 1 p.m. Pacific, and will feature Dr. Kamal Jethwani of Decimal Health. He brings over 15 years of experience in digital health, product strategy, design, and validation to help companies create and take high impact solutions for healthcare consumers to market. You can also register for uh, Professor Jethwani's talk on our website. I'd like to go over some virtual participation guidelines before we get into our talk today. Please post all of your questions in the Q&A box on Zoom. You should see a Q&A box at the bottom center area of your screen. Once you're in there and you post a question or you see other questions from your peer participants viewing, you can give those questions a thumbs up and that will bring it to the top of the Q&A window, uh, indicating that there's widespread support for that question and that we should ask it. Questions will be addressed at the end of the talk in about the last 10 minutes. Today, we are joined by Professor Saul Shung, Professor of Public Policy um, here at the University of California, Berkeley, and he'll be discussing data, global challenges, and planetary management. Sheng earned a BS in Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Science and a BS in Urban Studies and Planning from MIT and received his PhD in Sustainable Development from Columbia University. He was a postdoctoral fellow in Applied Econometrics at the National Bureau of Economic Research, NBER, and a postdoctoral fellow in Science, Technology, and Environmental Policy at Princeton University. Sheng is currently the Chancellor's Professor of Public Policy at UC Berkeley, a director of the Climate Impact Lab, and a research associate at NBER, and a National Geographic Explorer. It's my great honor to welcome you, Professor Saul Shung. Uh, we're really looking forward to your presentation today. I'll pass it over to you. Thanks so much uh, for having me. It's a delight to be here and to uh, share our work with this community. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, <clears throat> so you all can see my slide deck, hopefully. Um, and so today, what I'd like to do is share with you some of our work and talk to you about how data science is playing a big role in how we understand uh, our ability to manage global challenges around the world and the idea that we are now presently able to manage, think about, begin considering managing the planet uh, in a holistic way. You know, at the Global Policy Lab, we come in every day and we, we think about the world in a holistic way, trying to understand whether or not we can manage resources in a way that maximizes global well-being. And one of the central challenges is the just sheer number of people around the world humming and working their, to take care of their families as best they can. Uh, this tremendous amount of activity puts a you know, new strain on the planet. And I think many people here would be familiar with the concern that perhaps you know, these strains on the planet, these changes in how we are utilizing our resources could in turn uh, impact the global community. So some of our research, for example, suggests uh, that historical changes in the environment. So here what I'm showing you are time series lines. The black lines show time series of the climate in different regions of the world throughout history. Throughout, uh, And the orange bars are showing you periods of major social disruption. And so what we know from history and archaeology, paleoclimatology, is that societies around the world have become 
fundamentally destabilized, whether it's the collapse of dynasties in China, the collapse of the Mayan empire, uh, the breakdown of Angkor Wat in Cambodia or ma massive migrations across Europe. And so those types of concerns, looking back at the ways in which the environment has affected us, makes us concerned today that maybe as we impact the environment, it could impact, uh, affect us in similarly disruptive ways. Now, the explosive human progress around the world is fantastic. It is bringing livelihoods, it raising livelihoods around the world, but at the same time, it creates new challenges that we are not terribly well organized uh, to counter at the present moment. So many of these things are at a scale. So whether you think about the oceans or climate change, they transcend national boundaries. And if we're going to sustain global economic development, we need to begin to start thinking about how we manage global resources in some sort of holistic, systematic way. The good news is that the innovations that have gotten us to this point are really powerful technological tools, whether it's computing and data science, that I will make the case empower us to take on this challenge of you know, deploying, this, uh, deploying planetary man management at a real scale. If you, I like to show this graph sometimes for people to think about uh, policy and governance as if it were a technology. So throughout human history, there have been major revolutions in the technology available that, to us to use to govern ourselves. You know, a long time ago, people first conceived of the idea we should write down our laws, maybe we should vote, we should promote people based on merit. You know, at one point people pointed out maybe we should even just begin to consider the idea that individuals were, are equal and that they should be treated equally before the law. International governance has emerged as a major regime shift around the world. And what I will make the case for is that data science and large scale computing are transforming and will transform in the near future how we manage the planet. So if we are going to take on this idea of managing the planet holistically, what would be the necessary conditions? You know, I would, I often think, well, can we, can we have these institutions at a global scale that work effectively? Are we able to organize in ways that can actually manage planetary resources? Even if we have those institutions, can we understand the different trade-offs we face? If we, you know, uh, take a certain policy action versus an alternative, can we evaluate what are actually better or worse, alter better or worse outcomes in those uh, different states? And then finally, even if we can think about uh, different types of outcomes, and even if we are mobilized or organized to do things, can we surveil the planet? Can we understand what is happening around the world fast enough that we can respond and adapt? You know, you could think like steering the proverbial ship. So what I will make the case for you today is that through some of our work, we think we show that the answer to many of these questions are yes. So I'm going to run through a couple different uh, research projects, give you a sense of the type of research we're doing at the Global Policy Lab to answer these, th these questions and to shine a light on how we can use data science in the future. So thinking about whether or not global institutions might be effective, it's worth pointing out that uh, you know, we are in a moment in time in which global institutions are coalescing, they're becoming more effective, they are evolving and changing and adapting to circumstances. It is sometimes fashionable to talk about many different global institutions like the World Bank, the United Nations, as not delivering everything we might dream at this particular moment. And, and I would agree with many of the critiques that are out there, but I think many people do not realize exactly how quickly these systems are changing and evolving. So for example, here I'm showing you uh, a meeting of the International Seabed Authority that only came into force in 1994 and the International Criminal Court, which represents a transformation of international humanitarian law. So we are in an environment in which these institutions are changing and some of those institutions might be able to effectively manage planetary, re planetary resources. So just as an example, one can ask, or, you know, does the law of the sea work? So the law of the sea is a governing uh, treaty that governs almost all countries in the world that have signed onto it. It only came into force in 1994. And as a major part of the treaty, countries agreed to actually assign rights to use exclusive economic rights to the boundary waters of every country. So the exclusive economic zone is roughly 200 nautical miles off the coast. And one of my students, Gabe Englander, did a really interesting study asking whether or not this type of institution could possibly work. You know, you're 200 nautical miles off the coast of a, of a country, 
no one's around, are you gonna respect the rights of that country? Are these institutions effective? And so to study that question, Gabe looked at satellite data, he looked at tracking data of fishing boats around the world as they approached the boundary, this sort of imaginary line out in the middle of the ocean that, uh, and as these boats approach this line, do they actually respect this boundary? Does this work to effectively govern uh, how this resource is allocated? And so here's a picture of, of where the boats are occurring. And he also looks at night lights because sometimes these boats use lights as they're fishing. And so you can see at night uh, by satellite where the boats are, are having, being active. So here's a graph of Gabe's results. And what you see on the left are uh, the number of the, the brightness of the boats on the surface of the water. On the left are the high seas, which are open access to all different countries. And on the right are the exclusive economic zones of different countries around the world. And what you see is a really dramatic change in how much fishing activity is happening right at the boundary of these EEZs. So over here, we see lots of boats are actually coming up right against the boundary and they are stopping. They're actually respecting this arbitrary border out in the middle of the ocean. And you can also look at the tracking data from the, from the boats themselves and look at unauthorized fishing vessels. And you actually see the exact same pattern where a huge number of foreign fishing vessels that are not authorized to come into the exclusive economic zone are actually respecting these boundary waters created recently by international treaty. If you were to map the effectiveness of these borders around the world, you see bound, so the brightness of these lines indicates essentially how effective these borders are serving in terms of protecting fisheries around the world. And we see that the law of sea of the sea is indeed working. So we, you know, I take that as fairly reassuring. We're able to function in terms of governing ourselves in those man in that manner. But in other cases, it has not worked always the way we intended. So in a different global treaty, trying to manage global resources, the Convention on the International Trade of Endangered Species is a governing is a treaty in the governing body that has tried in the past to protect elephant populations by limiting trade in ivory. Now, one major challenge to doing that is the emergence of black markets around the world. And these black markets have been hard to regulate, but one thing that CITES has tried to do is to flood the market with legal ivory, depressing the price, thereby reducing poaching. So this is a policy that is, a, is sometimes implemented in different contexts, but it's been unclear the extent to which it's working. So in 2008, CITES actually created and did an experimental one-time sale where four countries that had been protecting their elephants very, very effectively were allowed to legally sell ivory to Japan and China, where it was then resold and distributed uh, in domestic markets. So this was essentially a massive global experiment in how can an international institution suppress black market activity. And what was interesting is that people around the world disagreed on what might happen. So for example, The Economist argued at the time just before the sale that the legal supply of, supply of ivory would depress the price and reduce the incentive to, pro to poach. This is Economics 101, but many people didn't actually understand what was going on. So populations in China were a bit confused about what, which types of ivory were legal or illegal. And there were also reports that within China, there were after the legal ivory was sold, uh, there were a bunch of safeguards put in place to document which elements of ivory were produced through the legal system and which elements of ivory came through the black market. What was perhaps not as surprising ex post, but surprising beforehand, to, that was not expected beforehand, is that the cards used to document that the ivory was of legal origin were actually not clear enough in their photographs about which item was actually associated with which card. And so sometimes individuals would go into the store, they would purchase an element of ivory, the card would be shown to them to document that it was of legal origin, the card would be kept by the store and used to sell another bit of ivory. And so in this case, the legal system that was set up was actually utilized to launder many types of illegal ivory that were being resold throughout the market. So I'm not gonna explain this graph to you, but what we did in some work is sort of tried to explore the ideas of how the black market might interact with the legal markets here. And what and the base, basic result is that many things can happen. And that at the end of the day, what you need is real world data. So we looked at data on elephants that were poached. Here's an image of an elephant whose horns were being collected so that they could be brought uh, and under the 
to be held by the go uh, local government so that they wouldn't enter the black market. There's large scale anti-poaching efforts trying to cope with these, um, cope with poachers moving in from often from countries that have had civil wars and are highly armed. But the ivory itself is when it's legally sold in China is actually used to construct really beautiful um, artifacts that are sold in established stores like this one here. So when we tried to understand what happened when this legal sale occurred, what we saw is that there were poaching rates that were fair, holding fairly steady across the continent of Africa. And then the moment the legal sale was announced, we actually saw that it backfired tremendously. So poaching across Africa increased quite abruptly, almost 60%. And what we think is happening is that basically because of the ability to launder the ivory and because consumers were confused about what ivory was legal and what was illegal, you actually saw demand for ivory rise so much that the legal supply of ivory could not uh, take, it could not satisfy all that demand. And it actually exacerbated what was happening in the black market. Now this analysis showed that there was increased poaching in countries all across Africa, even though it was just a result of policy changes in a few localities in Southern Africa here. You can we've also looked at whether or not smuggling patterns changed across Africa by looking at whether or not illegal ivory was captured in different locations. And what we see is that over time, uh, smuggling was roughly constant. And then again, when the ivory was sale occurred, uh, smuggling of raw ivory out of Africa increased abruptly. Now, what was nice and reassuring is that actually this information made it to CITES and it was used in the discussions uh, a few years ago about whether or not they should reopen legal markets for, for ivory. And in fact, that information played a role uh, along with much other research and information in, in, this, in the decision by CITES uh, not to reopen these markets. So what I had just shown you is that we are developing and building institutions that are, we are learning about by applying data science. We are also using data science to try and understand what trade-offs might exist in different types of global policies. So as an example, you can think about ongoing debates that we've participated in trying to understand how to manage global climate change. So we are right now at this particular moment in time where we have to make decisions about whether to invest in transforming the global energy system and travel down one of these paths or and when we get down one of those roads, what might we do to adapt to a changing climate. Now, when you think about the choices ahead of us, you know, you can, a stylized way to present them is say, well, we can invest today, we can pay a lot to mitigate climate change. And in the future, society, future generations will reap those benefits. An alternative is to allow the climate change to occur. And then we can allow future society or ourselves in the future to pay to cope with those changes. And we would pay through adaptation. Ultimately, to understand which one of these options might be better for different populations, we need to do systematic analysis of costs and benefits. And we can think about distributional consequences of different policies. Over the last several years, what has happened in the field is that we've developed new econometric tools to try and understand how changes in the climate manifest into changes in society. So just, you know, this is kind of the most technical image. This is a diagram we developed where you can imagine the climate is some distribution of environmental outcomes and maybe the climate would shift from climate one to climate two. What we see is a bunch of different data, you know, different weather events occur, different storms might occur. And then the data scientist or the econometrician is trying to understand the shape of this function. And this function describes how a change in this climate variable might lead to some change in the social outcome. And so what you can see here, as it's been depicted, as you move to the right, the outcome increases. And we can use this function to then map and generate projections or predictions about what the distribution of social outcomes might be in climate one versus climate two. And this helps us paint a picture and understand how populations both might adapt and what the impact of climate change would be on different populations. So myself and colleagues have been involved in these types of uh, studies where we try to understand the building block, how the building blocks of the economy, for example, are impacted by the climate. So what you see here are changes in temperature are associated with changes in crop yields throughout the United States. Here is the case of corn. So as temperature increases, corn yields in increase up to a point, and then they fall precipitously at around 29 degrees Celsius. 
We also see that people behave a little bit like corn plants where, you know, they, they work fairly hard. Maybe they work even harder as they approach our, what is a comfortable temperature to humans. And then at very high temperatures, people start leaving work. They can't work anymore. And we just had a heat wave pass through the Bay Area. And I felt like I was living in this diagram. So what we do with these types of studies is just like I showed you in that, in that first plot, we try to rebuild a projection of what climate change might do to a population. So here on the left are two different ways populations respond uh, in terms of to temperature, in terms of violent crime on the top or human health on the bottom. And you see two different patterns in how the populations respond. So for violent crime, we essentially see that as temperatures increase, rates of violent crime increase steadily. And so in a projection of the future, we see that violent crime sort of increases relatively uniformly as all parts of the country get warmer. But when we look at human health, we see that for low temperatures, excess mortality is high. And for high temperatures, excess mortality is high. And so as populations across the country get warmer, what really matters is whether you start out on the left or you start out on the right. So populations that are already quite hot ex go get hotter and they experience increased excess mortality. Whereas populations that were down here and were fairly cold initially, they actually experience lowered excess mortality. And that pattern, pattern manifests when we develop projections of what how climate change might impact different counties across the US. Hotter populations across the South tend to experience increased mortality more acutely, while as the North might actually benefit. What we can then do is take mountains of data and try to do these types of calculations for all elements of the economy, looking at changes in labor, changes in agriculture, changes in energy, changes in crime, and put together a holistic picture of what might happen to any population. In this particular study, it was the United States. And then we can also add up these impacts. So in a variety of different simulations, we can think about how global climate change would lead to economic damage to the United States. And each dot here is a single simulation where its position on the horizontal axis is a measure of how much the global temperature would change. So here is two degrees Celsius. And on the Y axis is one measure based on this enumeration of what economic damage would be in a single year from those types of changes. We can then put together other simulations for higher temperatures and other simulations that explore even higher temperatures still. And what that allows us to do, if we fit a line, is to develop some sense of how changing global temperatures would manifest as economic costs to any population, in this case, the United States. Now, what I just showed you is one study of how we enumerate these impacts across the country. We also uh, look at macroeconomic data and look at how the economic performance of individual countries changes as temperatures change. And in those studies, what we see is that populations get warmer, their productivity increases up to a point. There's sort of an optimal temperature around 13 degrees Celsius uh, at a country level. And then as temperatures increase further still, we observe the same countries actually slow down and reduce their economic productivity. So if we take these results and we plug them into a simulation of the future, we get a projection for what the world might look like 100 years from now or 80 years from now. Uh, and what you see is that across the tropical band, populations that are already hot, they're on the downward sloping side of that curve. And so as temperatures increase, the economies slow down further and it can be quite disastrous. So here is a projection for South Asia, which looks very different from a, what a projection on, of Europe might look like. Europe actually benefits in some cases because its temperatures are so low that as it warms up, it's going up that hill. If you aggregate this information around the world and try to paint a picture of how the global economy might respond, you see that the globe on average might be substantially poorer in the future. Although on the graph on the left, you can see the spread of possible outcomes. There's a great deal of uncertainty. So allowing the environment to change makes the future more uncertain. And because the tropical regions that suffer the most are also today the poorest regions, what we see is that climate change widens the gap between the richest countries and the poorest countries, leading to a, a future that is substantially more unequal. So these types of calculations allow us to paint a picture of the different types of options ahead of us. So here's just a visualization I, I put together with some colleagues at one point. On the left, the colors indicate the temperature changes in the future. On the right, our temperature changes if we if we work hard to mitigate climate change today, which would be quite costly. 
And the color of the night of the lights, the human activity here has been scaled to reflect the projected changes in economic activity. And so what you can see is in the tropics, there's less activity in the future, but places like Europe could benefit. A world that doesn't warm as quickly would have a very different profile for in terms of economic activity. So data science is allowing us to paint these types of pictures to understand the choices ahead of us and to think about the value of mitigating climate change today. It also allows us to think through what we might do in the future. If climate change does occur, how might we adapt? So in one particular study, we actually asked and, and the question of how populations might respond with geoengineering, which is this concept that has now emerged, uh, basically arguing perhaps we can emulate the behavior of volcanoes intentionally, spraying, uh, uh, aerosols into the upper atmosphere. We know from volcanoes that if we were to do this, it would actually cause the surface to cool. And so there are a variety of proposals out there to intentionally put aerosols into the upper atmosphere to reflect the sun's rays and counteract the effects of human caused climate change. And this might sound far fetched, but in fact, it's a fairly serious proposal that is gaining momentum and a large number of uh, research teams are trying to understand how one might do this effectively. So for example, the National Academies has now done several studies pointing out that we, this might become part of a portfolio of climate response strategies, although we don't know about its effectiveness or cost. And some leaders, so for example, the chair of the House Science Committee at one point said, perhaps we should deploy geoengineering as an effective tool to address climate change. So these are fairly serious policy proposals that are emerging we realized that if we were to spray dust in the atmosphere, this type of adaptation strategy might have unintended consequences. So what you might see, for example, is crops around the world could respond to changing sunlight. Crops use sunlight. And so if we were to put a lot of aerosols in the upper atmosphere, it would change photosynthetic activity. Now, there are some theories from agronomics about what might happen. And essentially, it's a horse race where you know, if you were to put up aerosols in the atmosphere, you essentially are dimming the sun a little bit on the surface and that would slow down plant growth. But you do get some benefits because as you scatter light around from these clouds of, in, the uh, in the upper stratosphere, the light comes in at more diffuse angles and that actually increases plant productivity. So ultimately it's an empirical question whether or not this type of strategy would increase global agricultural output or decrease it. There is some evidence that from lab experiments, for example, that plants themselves adapt to these changes in the environment. So here's an example of two radishes. The one on the left was grown in normal conditions. The one on the right was grown in low light conditions. What you see is perhaps unsurprising, the plant in low light conditions is trying to get more light by growing its leaves quite large, but at the cost of the part of the plant that we end up wanting to eat. And so we might actually see yields around the world respond to this type of geoengineering exercise in ways that are not what we are hoping for. So to try and understand what these consequences might be, we actually went back in time and studied the eruption of some of the volcanoes that originally inspired these geoengineering proposals. So this is the eruption of Mount Pinatubo. And so what we actually did is we simulated and took data on where the cloud of dust coming out of Mount Pinatubo or as a result of Mount Pinatubo was shading different parts of the planet in the different months following that eruption. And we built this reconstruction and then tried to use some of the data-driven techniques to understand what was the effect of dimming sunlight from this eruption and the eruption of El Chichon roughly a decade earlier. What you see is the main, one of our main results from this study, which is the dimming from the sunlight itself actually reduced global agricultural yields and different crops were impacted differently, but to the tune of roughly 7% uh, of global agricultural output was diminished by the dimming of the sun during these events. And so this allows us to do a cost benefit calculation in the future. If we were to deploy geoengineering using something that resembled uh, the particles similar to the to Pinatubo or El Chichon, previous eruptions, there would actually be substantial benefits for crops in terms of cooling the surface. But what this study was showing is that there are 
in addition to those benefits, there are substantial costs from reductions in sunlight available for photosynthesis. So when you combine these two effects, the net effect of this overall strategy for agriculture is roughly zero. So the, the point here is that this strategy, if used to preserve global agricultural yields, does not look like it would be tremendously effective. So answering this question, this type of cost benefit analysis about potential adaptation strategies is something that is only now becoming available using these types of tools. The last question to explore is to think about whether or not we are able to monitor the planet effectively enough to you know, really change course midway. If we see that we are doing something in real time that is not working terribly well, uh, will we become aware of it quickly enough that we can respond? And I think this is one of the very exciting new areas that our team and others are starting to explore. So one thing we reflected on and realized is that, you know, right now there are just a huge number of satellites around the planet. You know, we are observing the planet. We're in a data rich world today. There's over 700 satellites circling the earth. This is just a data visualization to give a sense of all the satellites that are actually in orbit, although it's not totally to scale. And collectively, these satellites are pulling down over 100 terabytes of imagery per day, imaging now the entire planet on a daily basis. So this is a very exciting moment in time when, it, in theory, we are collecting enough data to observe the planet all the time. But this is such a fire hose of data that it's almost too much to digest. And in fact, the challenge now is, is how can we take that data and use it for any kind of decision making? What we and others are realizing is that machine learning as a tool, you know, it can be used to predict many different types of outcomes, but it also can be used to transform this fire hose of unstructured satellite imagery into highly structured data about outcomes we care about for society and the environment that can then be used and deployed for decision-making purposes. So machine learning is often discussed as a game changer in this context. And we were reflecting on this point and asked, well, why hasn't the game fully changed yet? Why aren't we using these hundreds of terabytes of data in all sorts of decisions continuously around the world? And what we realized is that while this theoretical tech, this technology can theoretically change the game, it's kind of been restricted in terms of who's using it because it requires so much expertise, so much compute, and so many years of research to understand how to transform this volume of data into structured information that there are so many barriers to entry that the many different organizations, whether it's the United Nations or the World Bank or, or uh, NGOs in the field are unable to actually utilize this information or these new technologies. And so while we're collecting this information, it's essentially going to waste. Now, what we thought is, well, if we could mm, open the doors, make it available to populations around the world so that essentially anyone, here's a woman working on an anti-poaching uh, program in, in Southern Africa, if they could use this information to monitor what was happening in their local region, taking advantage of these terabytes and terabytes of imagery coming down, maybe they could solve their own problems in sort of a decentralized way. Right now, there's startups out there and a few research labs trying to understand you know, how, we can how we can transform imagery into useful information, but they can't, they just can't deliver this information to every single possible user on the ground and every single possible use case. And so in our effort to increase access to these types of technologies, we realized that what we really need to do is generalize how we apply machine learning to satellite imagery. So the problem kind of is depicted here where you see there's sort of two different axes. On the horizontal axis, we can rank images based on how much forest cover there is, just as an example of one variable. And on the vertical axis, we can rank images based on how many people are in the image. And what you see is every single image can kind of be populating, populated in this space where there's different dimensions of the image that are useful to different types of people. What would be great is if we could come up with an approach where each image was analyzed in a way only once, but then different people could come and read off the right kind of information that was affecting them on their particular problem. Now to do that, requires some technique 
for pulling information out of the images that can be used to predict or understand many different types of variables. Things that we, the researchers, might not know about today, but who users on the ground in the field in the future might come up with as an important outcome or a variable that they want to study on the ground. So we developed a, an approach that actually tries to generalize uh, a solution to this problem. And I'll show you a picture here of the pipeline, but it's, it's not really for uh, us to go th get into in detail. But the basic idea is you have a large number of images around the world. And what we did is we developed a unsupervised embedding where we take these images and we turn them into data. So it's basically tabular data that is something kind of like an Excel spreadsheet that anyone could download. So now this data doesn't require that you know how to access or uh, manipulate satellite imagery. All you need to do is be able to download you know, a CSV file. And then it, what an individual user on the ground could do is they could say, well, I have some data on some local challenge or some environmental question that I'm trying to study, keep track of. They can take this data, match their data to our data and use it basically in a simple linear regression model to generate maps of what is going on around them. Now, what's neat is that the same data set can be applied by a totally different individual in a totally different context, trying to study something totally separate. They just take the data, they run their own local simple regression, and they generate predictions to study the type of problem that they have, that they have information on. Now, to demonstrate that this works, we actually had to collect information in a context where we knew what was the correct answer and what was the wrong answer. So we actually studied the, United, the entire United States because we had a variety of different types of data we could study. So we applied this across the US. On the left is what the original data looks like. And then the validation data is data that the model never sees. And what we saw was that we were able to estimate, for example, how much of individual locations had forest cover. And it's very simple. You know, it's only a few lines of code to actually implement this. And taking the same featureization of the imagery, we were actually able to, to predict population density across the United States. So we can essentially observe this with a high degree of accuracy using the exact same data, no additional expert knowledge. Similarly, we can actually predict and observe elevation using satellite imagery. We've studied elevation, not because we don't know elevation, but because it was a way to test out whether or not this method was effective for yet another totally different type of variable. We also could study whether or not daytime imagery was able to predict what locations look like at night. So how luminous different locations were. We also got information on housing prices across the country. And it turns out using satellite imagery and our simple procedure, we can, with a pretty high degree of, uh, we can make pretty reasonable, useful predictions about the value of property uh, that is observed from a satellite image. We can also count how long roads are, and we can actually take data from the US Census and reconstruct estimates of household income in different regions across the country. And so what's quite exciting is that we now have a single approach that's relatively fast and allows us to study all sorts of different problems. You know, and managing global challenges requires that we understand a variety of different variables at very large scales around the world. And so in principle, we need the tools to digest satellite imagery and generate all sorts of outcomes so that we can understand what's happening on the ground. Another element that's exciting about this work is it actually performs essentially as well as state-of-the-art machine learning techniques, deep neural networks that are basically the cutting edge, the golden standard for these types of uh, machine learning exercises. But the great benefit of what we've done here is we've simplified the procedure so much that it has fallen in terms of its computational cost by many orders of magnitude. So the type of machine learning problem that could only be solved by like an elite university team, for example, which would take you know, eight hours just running on a GPU in the cloud, now can be solved on a laptop in less than two minutes. right? Uh, or if you have a GPU, it's only one second. You know? So what we've done here is made the process of harnessing satellite imagery and linking it to machine learning vastly easier so that hopefully users in different contexts can start taking advantage of this astounding technology. What the other aspect that's exciting here is that it actually allows us to zoom in and learn about what is happening on the ground in finer detail than we might have originally known. So 
this particular work allows us to achieve something called super resolution. So for example, we might have information about a large pixel, about the pop how many people live in a particular region. And then we can augment this information with the image to reconstruct even finer detailed images of what is happening on the ground, where populations are distributed, where the forests are, even though the original data that we obtained from administrative sources was of much coarser quality. We can also take this and scale it up. And so this is the ultimate goal and we tried it out as best we could. Here are four of the different variables I was showing you before. And we are able to at a pretty high level of performance, uh, although of course I'm sure teams in, in the future will improve upon this as, as they always do. Uh, we are able to use a single set of image features to reconstruct a variety of variable, variables across the entire planet. Uh, and so we think that this really opens the door to deploying this kind of this kind of fast, simple technology opens the door to daily observation of, of hundreds of variables in the future so that we can really understand and surveil uh, what is happening around the planet and manage problems or changes as they occur in real time. So what I hope I've convinced you of is that we have some answers to these questions. You know, what I've shown you here are just examples from our team at Berkeley and what we've been doing. But of course, I'm sure there's many other teams around the world working on these things. We think we have evidence that yes, we are now at a stage in human development where we are, have global institutions that in some cases, like I showed you with the exclusive economic zones and the law of the sea work very well. We also have the ability to identify when the institutions are not working very well. So the CITES legal sale, for example, kind of backfired and it was important to identify that so the institution could adapt and change its policies moving forward. We also are now really understanding what are the trade-offs in different types of policies. For example, if we allow the climate to change, what are the costs and benefits to different societies within the United States or across the world? And if we were to engage in different adaptive strategies, global, global policies like geoengineering, which will affect the entire planet, what would be the costs and benefits to a particular industry like agriculture? And then finally, on the third point, can we gather information fast enough in real time that we can actually adjust and adapt and respond to changes as they occur? And machine learning is the game changer. It is fundamentally transforming how we are able to understand what is happening around the planet. And it will hopefully empower us to do it fast enough that we can respond to these things. So I just, you know, returning to this idea that we have technology of governance, it's worth reflecting. I sort of use these types of analogies with, with students sometimes on where we are today. You know, the, the governance institutions we have around the world, they're not only just governments, in many cases, NGOs, international institutions, civil society, private firms are playing a ma major role. But the level of sophistication has changed dramatically over the last millennium. So, you know, we, we had governments, we had organizations that were governing populations a thousand years ago. But if it were a technology, if I were looking at this like an engineer, I'd say the changes that have occurred are something like a, going from a horse and buggy or covered wagon. You know, we had an, the enlightenment, we started uh, writing down constitutions for countries. That's something like the, the cars being developed. But now the global economy is moving fast. There are so many changes happening around the world. In many cases, they are tremendously powerful, very exciting. But that, with that power comes the ability to cause disruption and negative outcomes equally fast. Just like a plane is a very powerful tool that if uh, you make a mistake can lead to very costly outcomes. And so in reflecting on sort of governance of the planet as something that is now being like we are society, basically we're on this plane right now. And data science is playing a key role because first of all, I point out to folks, you know, I don't think any of you would ever get on a plane if I had only written down a theory for how the plane should work and had never tested it out. So going out there in the world, collecting data on the policies or the things we've tried allow us to really kick the tires, test things out and understand what works. You wouldn't get on a plane if I had just developed a theory about it and we should not manage the planet just based on some set of theories. We should get out there with data and understand what works. 
And the other thing that I was pointing out is that at the same time, we need to understand where we are and what would change if we make different decisions. So, you know, flying a plane requires a tremendous amount of data, a tremendous amount of instrumentation, the ability to understand where the plane is, to autocorrect and to adjust. And right now we do not yet have this full infrastructure for the global system, uh, but we can develop it and we are in the process of building it. And I think it's a very exciting to, a time to be at the interface of data science and policy and governance uh, as we are trying to envision what type of tools we'll need in the future. And with that, I know I'm a little early, but thank you so much for having me. And I would be happy to try and sort through a few of these questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Saul. That was absolutely fascinating, especially around how we can use data to predict and hopefully better adapt and prepare uh, and mitigate some of the harms that you mentioned. So I'm going to start with uh, some of the top voted questions here. The first one uh, is, you know, what would be your top one or two dream data sets that currently don't exist that you would want for building the best model for monitoring global management? So I have to say, I mean, some of these we were actually working on. Uh, and, and one of the biggest questions is what causes people to move around right now? You know, I think throughout history, one of the biggest destabilizing forces has been large migrations of populations. And, and obviously that is happening in response to legitimate pressures in many cases. I think large changes in the environment, whether it's degradation of ecosystems or climate change or fires in California, uh, cause huge movements of people, but we actually have a lot of difficulty understanding how many people move. So historically population movements, like migration is one of the most difficult things to track. And so the extent to which we can get information on how families are moving, where they're going to, what causes them to leave, I think that's just, um, one of the most pressing questions at this particular moment. Great, I'll move on to the next question here. Between the ivory sail and volcano model examples, it seems like human ingenuity, creativity is the kryptonite to modeling. How do you attempt to incorporate unknowns like mass human behavior, uh, as in the first example around humans reusing the legal stickers um, to sell illegal ivory? Um, and in the second example, perhaps humans resorting to more greenhouse usage to grow food crops when solar light is lower or more scattered. So I think in, in both cases, I think these examples are showing us why it's so important to, um, to see what works. You know, in reality, no, no innovation occurs where someone is able to completely and fully lay out exactly everything that will happen. You know, planes and cars were not developed always on paper, like they were developed on paper first, but there was lots of trial, lots of error. And I think what's really important is to understand that the development of any type of governance system involves a lot of trial and error as well. But what's crucial is that we learn from all the errors and we adapt and adjust to them so that we don't continue to make the same errors. So I think both of those are examples in which we had an idea and parts of it were very good and valuable and parts of it were not performing exactly the way we might've expected. And the role of data science is to help us identify those weaknesses so that in the next iteration, we can do a better job. I'd like to dig a little bit deeper into this um, because you, you raise these really great examples of where a policy change was put in place for a positive, for positive means, but there were these negative externalities. Uh, I imagine the modeling that you, that you do can be used to better predict some of these negative externalities. So how would you propose we go about doing that? How can we better predict what the positive and negative effects of a policy will be so that we can try to mitigate those effects? Or is it still the unknown unknowns and it's too difficult? So, so the, um, there's both to be. So there, there will always be unknown unknowns. We will try as hard as we can to illuminate all the adverse consequences of any policy as far ahead as possible. I think that is one goal and that is what many people in the field are trying to do, but we do need help. We need many more people working on these types of problems. And the actual analysis of climate change was a case in which I, we were trying to try to enumerate as systematically and comprehensively as possible, all the different potential outcomes that it could occur under different types of climate scenarios so that people do have a sense of the field. If we go down one road, we know some of the outcomes. If we go down another road, we know some of the outcomes. 
And of course, we'll never be able to predict everything perfectly. But I think that is a case in which we're really learning a lot by looking at what has happened retrospectively, uh, then combining that with theoretical models, some intuition, and then trying to develop a sense of what might happen down the road. I'm going to jump to an audience question, but then I have a couple more questions on that, that that we'll get back to, but I want to make sure that we cover their questions. The next question is, there's a significant inhibition in suggesting population growth is something to be managed by policy. What do you think is the value of and prospect of facilitating an honorable discussion of that set of tools? So that, that, uh, David is absolutely right that, that you know, policy guidance on population growth has always been uh, controversial and different societies have very different views on it. And I, I'm not one to say that any of those views are particularly wrong. I do think that nowadays we have a sense and some understanding, uh, for example, the United Nations population team has recent projections of global populations slowing down around the world. So there's been a lot of demographic transition in many wealthy countries. Most population growth in the future is expected to come out of Africa and the Current projections suggest global populations topping out around like 11 billion, plus or minus a few billion people. So that's a lot of people, but it is not the really exceptional exponential growth that I think people projected maybe 40, 50 years ago. And so I think today, uh, population growth per se is not a central target for policy. I think really what many people are trying to understand is how can we make sure that all the people who do arrive on this earth, uh, have a fair shot and equal opportunity at sort of improving their lives and maximizing the well-being of their family. And I think that is the central challenge 99% of folks in this field are really very focused on. I was really, um, yeah, it, it hit home when you were talking about the different effects of climate change and you were talking about the different social effects um, and also economic effects. And I think it's quite evident that there is a disparity in accepting climate change between Republicans and Democrats. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, maybe if you can show that potential economic effects, you might be able to get some acceptance on both sides of the aisle. And this raises a question for me about the uh, acceptance of the models that you're developing when you're going to policymakers, how receptive are they to using these models to inform their policy? And if you could focus um, on California and federally and how receptive they are, I'd be grateful for those insights. Yeah, so uh, I mean, there are a lot of points there. You're absolutely right that I think um, it is sometimes much easier for people on different sides of the political spectrum to sit down and look at some objective analysis try to come to some agreement about some basic set of facts. And then we might differ on how those things should be managed. But in many cases, uh, there's beneficial conversations from groups that might've disagreed initially about what could happen. And, and in fact, the analysis I showed you was one in which I think our results didn't really match what anyone was expecting. There were many people who thought climate change was like the end of the world. And in, uh, in other cases, they thought it was absolutely nothing. And we kind of ended in the middle of this donut hole in the middle where no one had put their any chips guessing that those were what the costs would look like. Uh, and I think that shows sort of the weakness of our minds and our intuition in terms of trying to guess these types of very complicated outcomes. We really have to sit down and sift through the data and hold ourselves um, to the numbers. I think through those exercises, we've gotten a lot of traction with policymakers. And so for, you know, when you, when you sit down with people and you show them the data and you let them see how, what a hurricane might do to a population in the data with themselves, it gets them to buy in and want to understand what they can do to fix it. So I think we've had a lot of success through the use of data to not rely so much on theoretical arguments, but just allow people to see for themselves what happens. Um, there have been all sorts of engagement at the state level, at the federal level. Just as an example, last week, the Congressional Budget Office released a paper describing how they take some of these results and are now adjusting uh, budget, federal budget pro projections uh, for climate change going forward. And I think under this administration, that is remarkable. Um, and so, you know, I think everybody, I, I think it's, uh, a very useful way to talk about these things rather than 
sort of these arguments that implicitly rely on a lot of assumptions or different value judgments, uh, let's find some numbers that we can agree on and then talk about how to address them. Exactly, that's right. Let the data talk and then have that inform policy strategies. We were wondering if you could actually touch on some of your projects and research in California. Um, you know, are you looking at the effects of the wildfires on displacement of people? I'm also interested in the effects of, you know, turning our economy, economy increasingly more digital as, you know, work becomes, an, you know, more jobs are going online and working from home and the um, disproportionate effects on communities that lack broadband access. So if you could talk about some, you know, bring it home to California, you know, in your research. Um, I think, I think California is, uh, playing a big role in, especially in terms of policy innovation. So a lot of what I was focusing on was the way in which we are innovating the technology of governance, like developing new ways to manage these systems. And California is constantly experimenting with new policies on how to deal to incentivize transitions and in energy usage, whether it's using more or less or changing sources, electric cars, exploration of space. California's a leader in a lot of things. And, uh, it's proven to be a really important laboratory. I think it's very important that people have this experimental attitude towards governance and California is just like such an innovator in that space. In terms of, I mean, I'm not an expert on the role of telecommunications in, in work. I think it's become clearly very, very important. And uh, it has the potential, I think, to level many different types of playing fields, you know, historically, People could only get access to a certain type of work if they could live in your community. And as it becomes harder for populations to move, if, if policies are changing, or then people can, can work elsewhere. So I think there's a, a lot of potential there, also in terms of reducing resource use. So whether it's actually like using fuels to commute, or I think a growing body of research indicates that how we literally organize settlements, right? Like whether people are in cities or spread out over land have huge long-term consequences for how much, re how resources are used and what resources are protected. And I think the idea of many people being able to work remotely uh, is changing how we are conceiving of what sort of basically urban planning is going to look like in the future. And speaking of remote work and, you know, that we no longer need to live in these densely populated cities, but we could move to other areas to do remote work. Um, in your uh, map, you showed that Europe might actually fare well for a period of time due to climate change and these changes. So I'm going to pick up on a question from the audience about Europe. Um, according to predictions, you kind of showed Europe might be more resilient to climate change than other regions of the world. However, would existing limitations in natural resources and the dense population um, of Europe affect those predictions? And as remote workers go there. <laughs> If they're they're smart. They'll move to Europe uh, to do remote work. I think I think result. You know, thinking about what will happen with Europe in the future, we have to be quite careful. And so I said Europe kind of casually, like talking about the average outcome in Europe. But in fact, Europe will, is very split. So Southern Europe is already quite hot and already quite dry. The Mediterranean climates will be very adversely impacted by heating and drying related to climate change. Uh, a lot of economic output in Europe is coming from locations further north where a lot of the year is quite cold. And so there is some notion that they could improve productivity, but that's not universal across all sectors of the economy. So agriculture can be impacted differently. Human health can be impacted differently. There are many aspects of human well-being that are unrelated to GDP growth. And I think that's important to, to recognize. It's also the case that the locations that become, I mean, as we have seen in California over the last few weeks, like people have poured out of the places that are difficult to be. And so if you're in one of the locations like Europe, that's a beneficiary of climate change, one might reasonably expect that as populations begin to mobilize and try to find better opportunities, if climate change is adversely affecting their home location, you may end up with a lot of people in the places that are benefiting. Like we saw in the US during the Dust Bowl, people left the West and flooded U.S. cities, and that led to detrimental effects in U.S. labor markets in those cities. So um, I think Europe will be impacted in a variety of ways. Some are beneficial, some are not so beneficial. 
All right, so I have one last question I hope we can get to in the next 30 seconds or so because we're almost at the hour. Um, can you comment on whether we are seeing any new technologies of governance with contemporary China, especially given the Chinese state's harnessing of big data to control its population in what are arguably dystopian ways? So I think uh, tech, uh, China and many East Asian countries, not, not just China, are trying all sorts of things. Uh, and I think you know, we in general live in a single country, each of us, and are, grow accustomed to the way things are done in our country. It's hard to impose value judgments on every dimension of the way in which other societies operate. And so I think if you travel to China and talk to people about some of the innovations, they think they're very beneficial. For example, they've reduced the spread of COVID-19 very effectively by certain tools that we have not used in the United States. And in other cases, their cost to society. And so China is definitely experimenting, but in very different ways than, say, California. Yeah. Saul, thank you so much for your presentation today. It was illuminating. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, for the audience, today's talk will be uh, made available on the Citrus YouTube channel, so you can go there and check it out. Thank you again, Saul. Thanks.